They say about gardening, to plant a garden is to believe in the future. When Jim and I proposed the Difference Engine initiative as one of the TIFF Nexus projects, we did it because after working in the games industry for a number of years, we were dissatisfied with its current state, but believed in its future. A future full of vibrant innovation of diverse games and game makers, um, and equal opportunity for all. We felt that we talked about it a lot and it was time to take some action. So through the Difference Engine initiative, we seek to plant the seeds of change and offer the creative and talented participants a rich environment in which to grow. The DEI is a framework based on Jim's artsy games incubators, offering participants who are new to game development um, a crash course in game making along with opportunity, guidance and inspiration in a warm and supportive environment. We hoped that the women involved in the Difference Engine would take that opportunity and run with it, filling it with their creativity and creating games showcasing their unique points of view and perspectives. And I think as you saw in that video, they certainly did. Jim and I led the first DEI sessions. And like the Artsy Games Incubator before it, the Difference Engine initiative was engineered as a program that anyone could run so it could propagate and spread. With that in mind, we asked two participants from the first incubator, Yuna and Sagan, to go on and lead the second. The participants from both incubators developed strong bonds with one another, thoughtful perspectives, and some really interesting games. And that's what you're going to be seeing today. This is just the beginning. The Difference Engine Initiative is an ongoing process, and we hope to continue the program with many more iterations in the future. These first two incubators had many successes and positive takeaways, but there are plenty of things that could be improved. We hope to learn from each experience to make each future incubator better than the last. This is just the start for the participants as well. These games represent their very first steps. I hope this experience awakens in at least some a fierce passion for making games. That's what this industry needs more of, individuals who have a driving need to express their ideas in game form and a strong desire to push the envelope for the love of their craft. And although this was successful in many ways, this initiative alone is not going to change the problems of gender disparity in the games industry. There are many social issues at play, and we all need to continue to work to change them. Progress is not predictable or inevitable, and it will require tireless effort and unrelenting dedication to create that future we so fervently want to see. With any garden, the seeds we plant need attention, cultivation, and lots of time to grow. And after all that, despite our best efforts, we still may not be as successful as we'd like. But I believe it's important to try and to keep trying. And hopefully this is a good start. So to get more in depth with some of the participants, I'd like to introduce Jade Raymond, who will be leading the panel that you're about to see. Jade is head of Ubisoft Toronto and is perhaps best known for her work as producer of Assassin's Creed 1 and executive producer of Assassin's Creed 2. Jade got her start in games working at IBM and Microsoft while studying computer science at McGill. She started the first R&D team at Sony Online, was then recruited to be a producer at EA Maxis for The Sims Online, and the rest is history. Please join me in welcoming Jade Raymond. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, everyone. So it's a real honor to be here speaking to you guys, and it was a real honor when Mayor and Jim asked me to participate in the Difference Engine. I have a lot of admiration for all of the work that they put in with their personal time to make this happen. And I'm really happy that TIFF and a bunch of other great organizations, including WIFT and OMDC and everyone else who's participated really believes in uh, this kind of exercise and supporting it because as we're going to see today hopefully I think that a lot of people got great stuff out of it. Um, so I'm really inspired. I'd like to, I'm not going to talk too much about my impressions. I will let the participants speak for themselves. I'd like to invite them up on stage and we'll start the panel.
Okay, I'm just checking if everyone's where they're supposed to be so I don't get too confused. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna start by opening things up with a general question that probably everyone in the audience is excited to hear about. Anyways, I am, so hopefully you are too. Um, and I hope that each one of you can kind of answer from your own perspective, uh, starting with Zoe. Um, so my question is, Games, just like every art form, are a creative endeavor, and I'm sure that each of you had some kind of idea and concept that you wanted to bring forth uh, when you created your games. I'd like to hear a little bit about your game and the idea that inspired you to create it. Why focus on the game that you did? So, so. Thanks, Jade. Um, my game is called Dame Game. It's a point-and-click adventure game. Um, obviously, I showed a little bit up there. Um, but I've been a web comics nerd for a long time, and there's been some pretty interesting um, stylistic experiment going on there in the last few years. And I wanted to try and um, bring together some sort of cross um, between games and comics. So I wanted to basically make a playable web comic, and then have it. If there's Easter eggs in there with an ARG element, where if you find it, it'll pop up a browser window, and you can read like fake things written by one of the main characters. And I also wanted to make a game about nerds more or less. Um, and not like the sexy lady nerd you may see in like, you know, various media. I wanted to have like no really kind of overly nerdy women. Um, so it's, uh, it's got a lot of that. And I also wanted to, I do stand up comedy in addition to that. And I wanted to write kind of a funny game too. So I went with that and it came together after many, many failures in Flash. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I uh, my background is animation. Um, I uh, I I have a degree in animation and have postgrad in animation from uh, Sheridan. Um, I did my uh, degree in animation in the UK, um, and I did uh, I came over here when I came over here. I did the 3D animation program. Um, originally, started off in 2D animation. And, and then I just wanted to get into 3D just to expand my skill set and see if I enjoyed it. Um, I it wasn't really into, um, into 3D that much. Um, and I wasn't really sure where I was going. Um, and this sort of different engine thing came up. I found it via um, Toronto Animated Image Society. So I went, uh, went for it. Um, and I, ha I have a strong background in, I've, I have a background in computer science a little bit. Um, my f well, I, I have a family of computer scientists. I don't know what it's like to have a grandmother who doesn't know how to use the internet. So um, I, um, so I, I thought I'd go for like the bit of coding background as well. And I guess I, the, the whole, uh, yeah, the whole coding side of games sort of really appealed to me. So I wanted to bring in like a creative game um, that was um, very, uh, sort of showcase my art talents and then enable me to sort of learn about um, coding as well. Um, so the game that I made was a point-and-click adventure game um, set in Newfoundland, as I said in the video. Um, I was, uh, despite my accent, I was born in Newfoundland. Um, I tell every person I meet that I'm from Newfoundland because um, <laughs> I can't seem to keep it to myself. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, I realised after I made it that there is no game. Um, I don't, can't think of any game unless anyone is happy, I'm happy to be corrected on this, that there's no game that's set in Newfoundland at all. Um, so I thought, well, I'll have a go at that. Um, and it's a really interesting place. There's a lot of folklore. There's a lot of really interesting um, characters and um, objects and history for it. So, um, and, the, and the game is sort of set in another world as well. It sort of goes on to different things. So, yeah, that was my main, my main inspiration background. So. Great. So we have to play it to get the new fee flavor. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a new fee flavor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, Hannah. So I would say that I'm a profoundly angry and disillusioned person <laughs> um, who's really interested in storytelling. And my background academically is in folklore. So my game reflects that in the sense that it's set up on YouTube as a platform which is like a free platform. Obviously, everyone knows that. And it's already connected to the internet and a huge community. So it's a choose your own adventure with yes or no options. For example, like the first question you're asked is, fuck you pigs, yes or no. Um, but because it is tied to the internet, um, I wanted it um, to be able to take in input from the user. So I don't want to be a top-down game. I want people to be able to contribute other options. So if you want to say, fuck you pigs, maybe, why, some other option, I have no idea, then please.
please like send me that game level and like you can do it in video or code or whatever way you want and I'll tie it into the game. And I want it to be like an endlessly branching story um, that everyone can tell like the last level, you confront the boss level and basically it asks, cause you're in a prison, my game is the immoral misconduct, you're a woman in prison. Um, you're asked, what is your prison? How are you kept there? And what are you gonna do for yourself? So at the very end, like you confront your own boss and there's lots of other levels because I consider myself philosophically inclined that I'm putting into the game, but I won't hold the microphone for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. I'm definitely intrigued. I like that concept. I haven't seen so many uh, video games and personally about women busting out of prison. So it's a good one. Um, Sagan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a recent... Sheridan grad, actually. I just graduated in May um, from the uh, classical animation program in Sheridan. I took four years of that. And so when people see my game, Icarus, the first thing they say is the graphics look really nice. And that's usually as far as the compliments go because the <laughs> mechanics aren't very good. But uh, it's obviously based on the, the Greek myth of Icarus, which is about the, the boy who flies too close to the sun and um, but the thing that always intrigued me about that story was uh, what happened before all the the action parts of that story happened. So um, what his time was like stuck on the island with his genius inventor dad and and what that must have been like for him. So it's kind of a reimagining if Icarus was like, you know, what I said in the video, he's like the slacker. The character design is uh, he's got black stringy hair that's hiding his face and he's got... Uh, a plaid shirt and stuff like that. I think my game might um, have been one of the only ones that had a male protagonist. Um, I think I tried to kind of swap the genders at one point, but then I was like, why? It, it didn't feel right, and I, uh, gender shouldn't be something that you can just swap out. So um, I kept it as male, but the character design is actually based on what I looked like in high school, and <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get rid of the plaid, as you can see, but... <laughs> Um, and as far as the mechanics go, it was uh, mostly inspired by, it's kind of a top-down um, adventure type game. It looks like it plays like an RPG, but it's actually more based on my experiences with interactive fiction and, and text-based adventures, because I, I really love the written word and uh, the, it can, just the flexibility of it, and you can create whole universes just with simple text. Um, but there are severe limitations, I feel, with that medium because like orienting yourself, like typing in, you know, I go north and there's a corridor northwest of me and stuff like that, like I couldn't figure that out. So I, I, if I could combine like those, um, the narrative aspects of those two things, I thought that would be cool. It's interesting. I definitely um, am hearing that in common with all of your game projects, a big narrative focus on the game project. It's interesting. Maybe we'll get into that later, depending on how time goes. Cicely. Uh, my game was um, Adeline's Elopement, and uh, I always refer to it as the Victorian game, and, uh, and people are like, oh yeah, that one. Um, I'm a big uh, English literature nerd, and um, a lot of my friends are also English literature nerds. We'll, we're the type of people who'll have like, you know, get-togethers to watch Masterpiece Theater. Um, you know, we're, we're that annoying kind of person. Um, and I started with the idea of wanting to make a Victorian game that uh, would appeal to me and my friends. I was like, I want to make my friends laugh with this game and, uh, and something that they would actually play. Um, so, Victorian game. And then I was reading a novel called um, the Romance of the Forest, which is kind of a terrible novel. Uh, don't read it, but um, it, uh, it has a main character named Adeline, um, and she, uh, she uncovers this really complicated plot, but she's also fainting all the time and uh, also gets abducted a lot, and I was sort of thinking, like, wouldn't it, uh, wouldn't it be both kind of hilarious and also very uh, interesting in this topic of women in games to have a female protagonist, but who is sort of sort of the opposite of what a game protagonist is supposed to be. Um, you know, like a, a protagonist who faints. And fainting didn't actually wind up making it into the game or any of that other stuff. Um, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite games um, 
that I played in the late 90s, I guess, was, uh, was Thief. I love the idea of uh, exploring this, um, this castle, um, stealing things and trying to, uh, trying to evade the other people in the castle. It was a lot of fun. I really loved playing it. So I wanted to make something that was, uh, that was kind of like that, um, except Victorian. So uh, Adeline's elopement came out of it. And uh, the reason the elopement plot line came in is that uh, I came across a different book. I was looking for um, literary heroines named Adeline. And there's um, a book about a woman named Adeline Mowbray, I believe, who, uh, who elopes. And then her entire life goes to hell, but she successfully elopes. So I wound up making that the theme of my game. Thank you. Alex. I'm an incredibly angry person who has to bicycle to work through Toronto traffic every <laughs> single day. And it infuriates me that this is an economically valid proposition. My finger in seven pieces versus the cost of the TTC for a daily commute. I don't think this is a valid political conversation. I think it's wrong. So I made an incredibly hard video game about it. Your goal is to get through an average Toronto side street without dying. <laughs> I wouldn't have made this game if I hadn't been in the hospital twice in three years as payment for wishing to ride my bicycle on a main street in the city of Toronto. This has nothing to do with flamethrowers. <laughs> As a cyclist, I can definitely identify. I take only side roads when I bike to work, when I'm feeling brave and I've had a coffee is the only time I attempt it. And I'm sure many other people in the audience, if you do bicycle, can probably also identify. So thank you. We can all live vicariously. Now we can all get our anger out in that game as well. Um, so I want to direct a question to Sagan and Cicely to start. Um, you talked a little bit about your background already, Sagan, about animation and stuff like that. Um, is there any way that your background kind of drove you to wanting to make a game? So you're already involved in animating, I think also Flash in your day job. Um, was it a creative outlook? What really got you excited about being involved in the Difference Engine? Um, I don't think animation really had anything to do with it. I I think I saw animation more as a tool that would help me, you know, make build the the eventual product of games. Um, I'd always had kind of a, a sneaking desire to build a game, but it, it's hard to say because in animation school, I think about ninety percent of the of my peers were playing a game at at some point or another probably when they were supposed to be doing their homework but and i i never um but that wasn't me i didn't really identify as one of those people who who gamed really even though i did play games so um i just thought it was an interesting medium that i wanted i wanted to uh it, it was a challenge that I wanted to get through, um, which actually it kind of brings me to something I wanted to talk a little bit about because um, I think one of the misconceptions around the Difference Engine was that every every one of us came to it as a blank sl uh, a blank slate, programming wise, but which, which wasn't true. Some women came into it and they had degrees in computer science. Uh, I was not one of those people. Um, that's impressive because your game did, I mean, when I stopped by, I was quite impressed with how advanced it was and how great it was looking and stuff. So you fooled me. I fooled myself. I, and I fooled myself in, uh, prior to doing this. I had fooled myself into believing that I, I couldn't make a game because I thought I had this idea of coding and programming as you have to m memorize huge, like, huge amounts of uh, mathematical algorithms and stuff like that, which, you know, I could do it if I, if I really put my mind to it, I suppose, but it, it would take a lot of time. And, uh, but one of the most valuable things I pulled out of this experience was that it wasn't a hard coding, really, that um, was my mental barrier. It was just learning how to think like a computer is the real secret to actual programming. Like, learning how to think in terms of computer logic, because I used a very simple game making tool, but even the, I found out even the most simple game making tools will require you to to think like that, to think logically, 
And then once I, fa- I figured that out, like, oh, a Boolean is just a yes or no question. Like if someone had told me that earlier, <laughs> I, I was kind of mad. Use those fancy words to <laughs> yeah, feel I was, I got Yeah, I was a little bit angry. <laughs> um, but, you know, and after, you know, hearing all these talks and um, Pearl Chen's talk especially, I think I, I, I'm more inspired to, to go further and actually learn some of the, the programming languages. Great. And Cicely, your background is definitely not in me- media right now, right? You don't do this as your day job, correct? It's, it's complicated. Okay. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my background is in, uh, in, in computer science, actually. I have a computer science degree. Um, and I worked for several years as a programmer, um, mostly writing really, really boring applications for banks where you move data from one database to a different database. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, um, like, while I, think, while I think that did help um, quite a bit when I was working on my first game, um, I had experience in how to think through the kinds of problems um, that come up when you're coding, and I knew what a Boolean was and everything. Um, but also, uh, I, I think it's interesting in, uh, in this conference as well, there's a lot of um, discussion about how uh, technology is intimidating, um, but really anyone can learn it. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and sometimes what, what I think is um, coming at it from the other side, someone from a technology background, um, is that drawing is also really intimidating and difficult. And uh, sometimes I look at my game and I think, wow, I wish it wasn't so ugly. I wish I knew how to draw. Mm-hmm. And uh, just, just kind of as a reminder that um, coding isn't the only skill that comes into play when you're, uh, when you're making a game or trying to do something creative with technology. Um, and uh, there are all kinds of skills that are useful and all kinds of skills that you might have to pick up. So um, if, someone, uh, if someone who has no programming background comes in and makes a game and says, uh, I can do it, so can you. Um, I could also say that because uh, making game art I found incredibly difficult and frustrating. Um, but if I can do it, so can you. <laughs> That's a great perspective. <laughs> so that actually leads uh, really well into a question that I wanted to ask this side of the room. Um, maybe I'll start with Katie. Uh, I'm kind of interested in this group dynamic because obviously the difference engine was set up in such a way where you aren't all working individually alone in a room on your project. You're all coming together and discussing them and everyone has a different background. So I'm kind of interested in how that group dynamic um, influenced your work and how it progressed and evolved. Um, yeah, I was just thinking um, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because I... I th- I was thinking the other day, I was talking to a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, he's in the UK, Scottish and angry and very mm-hmm. abrasive. Um, but he's also very nice, even though he said that, I meant to tell him about this game thing I was doing, and he's and he was just like, oh, you're all going to be really bitchy towards each other, and you're going to be backstabbing and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> he said, um, I, th- I thought, like, after going through the whole process, I didn't get anything like that. It was none of it. You didn't even... Th- get the feeling that people were there was no competitiveness there was no like um ang- there was anger but in a positive way you know <laughs> it was a positive anger everyone was angry but it was okay um and uh yeah like people were um like everyone was really supportive every every group um the group dynamic was really positive and you know every meeting that i went to you know there'd be times where we'd all like some of us had left stuff to the last minute and um, some of them didn't have anything, and um, you know there was the end level that I ended up creating, like literally at the last minute, but came out really well. But it was just like after every meeting, you go in, you you go in thinking like, oh my god, I've got to do this and this, and you know, what are they going to think of me? Are they going to sort of criticise me? But it was very supportive, very positive, and very um, yeah, it was it was really good. Like I leave every meeting. With, on a high, on a positive high. And I haven't done that. I didn't get the feeling even from university or, or any of the things. Sometimes I would, but this is super supportive. Everyone was like, yeah, you're doing great. You're doing awesome. Like, your stuff is really great. And you feel like you could achieve something. And that is a really, I feel like it's a really important part of this whole panel is that, you know, as women, we, in an industry that's dominated by males, it's, 
important for us to feel supported and feel like we can achieve something very easily, in fact. Like, we all made some games in six weeks, and a lot of that was to do with the amount of support that was within the group, so, yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah. yeah. And Hannah, did um, the group support help make your game a little less angry, or that was a lost cause? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I wanted to be as angry as possible in the hopes of finding like-minded individuals. Um, I'm actually going to say that I'm really competitive also and that I went to the meetings every week kind of hoping that I could win and that's why I totally circumvented all of the coding. Sorry, Pearl. Like, there's like no amount of convince me to code. No. And um, for some reason, every time I went in with something... Um, I was like ready to win and like have an edge. Everybody was just like really warm and welcoming. So I don't know. I don't really hang out with a lot of women. So it was like cool. <laughs> That's good. It's very honest of you. <laughs> That's good. Competition, you know, it's a fundamental part of making a good game. Games are all about competition. It's a healthy part of uh, the group dynamic as well. Um, okay, so now I have a question that will go on the ends here to Alex and Zoe. Um, mixing up the order here a bit. So maybe I'll start with Alex. Um, so, you know, I think what I've heard is that this has been a pretty inspiring project. Um, I heard from Sagan that um, she was involved in round two already. Um, has this experience inspired you to continue to sort of work with other women or mentor women or um, kind of extend this experience further? The easy answer to that is yes. The slightly harder answer to that is I am a grossly privileged individual and I went to girls' school. And I'd forgotten all of the good things about girls' school. It's somewhere in the haze of generic high school behavior. I was upset to realize recently that my girls' school had a 475% increase in tuition fees over the period of time since I joined to when I left, and more than 200% since I graduated, which basically means people like me and the most interesting people who were like me at the school are effectively cut off from that environment. I'd forgotten all the really good things about that environment. I'd forgotten about the support, and I'd forgotten about how great it was to just hang out with other girls who were really, really smart and interested in technical things. So the answer isn't just yes, it's hell yes, I'm going to take my crazy hacker space that was founded on a road trip and make it support women doing video games. That's the easy answer. The hard answer is how. Um, and that will be an interesting question to continue forward because certainly all girls education works. The question is how to get it to work so that it doesn't perpetuate a lot of other unpleasant things and how to get it to work for a wider array of people than the people who can pay the 475% increase in fees. The question is, you know, how to get it going. That's what I'm worried about. I want more girls doing this. That could be the subject of your next game. It could be all girls school <laughs> instead of the subject Psycho of my path. first game. <laughs> my, my first game was set in my high school, actually. I was a ringer for the Different Engine, and my very first game you wandered around a high school trying to make friends with these different girls in your high school, some of whom had purple hair. <laughs> no, I'm not lying. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> no, serious, tell us it was grade 13. Oh, is anyway, there a game no. mechanic around the purple hair particularly um, tough Okay, to so charm? the deal was my high school had like emergency exits and all the cool kids would hide out in the emergency exits because <laughs> they were contained and we would be like, oh God, no, we're not going to assembly. No, no, no. So the game mechanic was you had to find which child in the art department would give you the pass key to the secret exit and then you could escape to the roof where the cool girls were and you knew you got the pass key because the girl who had normal hair, it turned purple when you got the key. That was the mechanic. I thought it was rad. I nice. believe. Um, and Zoe. Hi, Zoe. That's actually Zoe, how I ended fitting, up with purple Fittingly. What, well, I wouldn't call that purple. That's more like fuchsia or it's sort of pink. Not purple. I guess, I'm, I guess I'm getting less cool. <laughs> um, so you have kind of a women-focused organization that you're running in your spare time. Uh, tell us about that. And it, was that something that was set up after your participation in the game, in the Difference Engine, or beforehand? Kind of simultaneously, actually. Um, there was a preliminary info meeting that just had um, 
why this is necessary, what the program was. And I was really inspired because it was a, it was a smallish room, but it was absolutely packed with women. There was so much support. There was obviously demand for this. And I, I mentioned that it would be cool to just take that forward so it wasn't just the, the, benef uh, the people who got to be in this awesome program that got the benefit of this, but then maybe pay it forward and have peer mentoring and stuff like that to continue it on. Um, and going through DEI has really helped me form what I want to do with that because the training's been great, like learning how to make games and what tools are, are available have, has been absolutely wonderful, but I found that the sense of community within the six women, especially like we were crunch timing several days before our games were due, we were freaking out on Twitter and stuff like that, really helped kind of make it feel possible and more workable, especially with the mentoring, like talking to you was great. Um, having Mare there was awesome, just seeing that it can be done. And so I started Dames Making Games uh, with my co-coordinator, Cecily, um, and we basically run socials to, to invite women in any aspect of gaming, whether they're journalists, whether they're uh, aspiring game makers, whether they've never made a game in their life and they're just curious, and just give that support back as much as possible. We're actually running a one month long game jam called January. You get bonus points if you can guess which month this is taking place in. <laughs> and it's going to basically invite a lot of the new members who have largely just been women who are curious and never made a game, uh, help them mentor each other. I'll be making a game for it too. Everybody just come together, have that sort of similar to the DEI, but far less um, structured and more just um, do it yourself ish. Uh, and then bring it together and just show the uh, small games that come out of it. And aside from that, we run socials every month that tends to boil down to a bunch of lady nerds getting drunk and yelling about things. <laughs> it's kind of my favorite thing. And you guys have a fittingly awesome name as well, so that's Thank also you. good. Um, okay, so I think we're running a little bit over, but I would like to ask one closing question, if that's okay. Do I have someone who's telling me I can't? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so to finish things up, I just would like each one of you to tell us a bit about, you know, what's next? Are you going to continue um, making games in your spare time? Uh, have you decided that you never want to touch this kind of project again? <laughs> if so, what are your other creative endeavors or what's on the... What's in the future, Alex? So the next game we're making is Super Street Fire. It's a fighting game where you hook on gloves and then you throw fireballs. And my job is to make the fire the appropriate color without spending another $50,000 on propane equipment. But the real answer that isn't just a joke that's also very true is that I would like to see uh, an all-girls game company come out of these sorts of things that does not necessarily emphasize the fact that it is an all-girl game company. I find it really important that we have that sort of support network around. Um, and I'm really interested in producing and releasing independent games, particularly as the frameworks for developing them get so much more easy. I mean, they are so easy. Holy crow. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Great. Cecily? Uh, I would definitely uh, describe the experience as life-changing, and I've actually gone on to make two more very small, very simple, and very uh, characteristically ugly games. Um, part of what happened is, uh, while I was doing the Difference Engine, I was also um, working as the social media person for a musical that was recently in town, and uh, they were called Ride the Cyclone, maybe some of you saw it. Um, and uh, as while I was doing all this social media work, I thought, hey, I've just finished um, the Difference Engine. It would be cool if I made them a game, and it would be kind of funny and fun and different. And uh, so I put it together, and uh, like people who do independent musical theater in Canada um, don't always think of themselves as, uh, as a group that might have a game that relates to their work. Like the, the game world doesn't touch uh, the theater world very often, um, but uh, when I made the game, they were like, wow, I love this, it's amazing. Um, and then I was approached by another theater company to do uh, another one um, that was called Save a Pinko, and it's about an ambulance driver for a play called Jesus Chrysler. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, um, I did go on to make, uh, to make more games, and uh, I want to continue making games, and I feel like, along with uh, Dames Making Games is a huge part of it, I feel like... Uh, there's so much unexplored territory in the video game world, um, connecting to 
like what I was involved in was Victorian literature and uh, opera um, and uh, theater and so on. And uh, games can actually enter into those communities and uh, those cultures can have games. Um, it, and it's something that, uh, that not a lot of people that I know of are doing yet and I'm excited to, to get in there and, uh, and start making those games. Great. Um, so I moved to Toronto in June. The Difference Engine 1 started in August, so I was a participant in Difference Engine 1, and then I was a coordinator in Difference Engine 2, which started almost immediately afterwards. Um, I'm going to take a break from gaming for a little bit. Um, I would like to spend a year perhaps teaching English in Japan or something like that. And then when I come back, I would I have ideas for two games. One game I would like to uh, I would like to make a game that helps me learn the um, Japanese characters, the kanji, because they are extremely difficult for me. And I think a game would be really cool for that. And then the other game I would like to make is called Distressing Scenes from Childhood. And I want each level to be a horrible, based on someone's horrible childhood memory. <laughs> and you'll have to wait at least a year before either of those two things happen, probably. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, people uh, often, since I've been so involved with the difference engine stuff, I get a lot of people asking me, when the next incubator is going to be, when, when Difference Engine 3 is going to happen. And I, unfortunately, can't really give them a solid answer, but I will be directing them to Dames Making Games, who are already setting up um, similar projects. And uh, so I'm, I'm just, it was an amazing, life-changing experience. So I'm, I'm really glad that there's this sort of infrastructure that I was a part of and that I will continue to be a part of and can sort of uh, lead people who didn't know about it previously to discover it for themselves. Great, thank you. Hannah? All of that um, money and power that Alex talked about earlier is definitely on the agenda. It sounds pretty enticing. Um, <laughs> find out what happens afterwards. Um, personally, right now I'm working on a feature film, it's my first one. So that's about it for games, I think. Although I feel like really I've, I've found um, a platform and a community for a certain kind of expression that if I ever do come up with a good idea, I could kind of channel it into a, this world now. And it's been really welcoming, so I hope it continues to be so. Great. Um, I actually... Uh I've made my game, um, and my game was based on ideas I've been working on for a really long time, and so it was really weird to have it put out there for everyone to see, and people seem to really respond well to it. Um, so I, I want to kind of continue it. Like, I have a whole storyline planned out that I've been working on for ages, so I'm going to sort of... Uh, it's, that's the great thing about games uh, the, and the experience mm. with this, is that I realised how easy it is and how accessible it is, and how much I really enjoy it. I really, I personally really enjoyed the whole experience of um, creating a game and it really um, ticks all the boxes for me. Like it has the sort of storyline ability. It's like you can put it onto the internet. It's very, uh, you can distribute it very easily. Um, and it means I can showcase my art and use my art um, and tell stories at the same time, which is essentially what I want to do. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely want to continue um, making making games, um, especially this game. I uh, want to continue it along the storyline. And yeah, um, it really was a really positive experience. I've, I, you, a lot of people said it's life-changing and it, I thought to myself, yeah, it's pretty much life-changing for me. It's just made me feel very differently about what I want to do with my life. So yeah. Great. Um, it's absolutely changed my life as well. Uh, I basically make full, uh, games full time right now. I'm working on four separate projects. I'm running DMG and I now write for Toronto Thumb. So I basically went from just kind of not knowing what I was doing and doing random uh, art disciplines to finally bringing that all together, which was kind of funny. It's like, I do music, I do art, I know how to code, I do writing. Clearly there's nothing that I can combine to, uh, these things together. 
um, oh, hey, I'm going to go play video games and think about it. Durr. Um, <laughs> so it, it's really between that and, and helping get other women, especially in Toronto, the, the indie scene here is amazing. I've met so many wonderful people that have just offered to give us nothing but support and help. Like Jim and Mare, the hand eyes have been great. Like it's such a good place, such a good community to welcome women into. And the fact that we've only been running for about, um, what is it, a month and a half, Cecily? Something like that? Yeah, and we've already got two games out of it from new members who had never made a game before. That is absolutely the best thing in the world for me, and I'm so happy to be part of it. And some, maybe sometime I will actually be able to finish the rest of my games and not just do that, but ideally that will happen soon. I'm very excited to be working on everything, and it's, it's seriously changed my life in ways I had not anticipated. So I think we all need to give these women a round of applause for all the great work. And of course, to um, thank you again to Mayor, and I don't know if Jim is here, he must be here somewhere, uh, for having this idea. Clearly it's caught on and it's gonna continue to live on. Um, thank you, Tiff, and to all of you guys who clearly um, care enough to come listen to this. Most of all, thank you for sharing your insight and your inspiration. It's been really interesting for me to hear all of the backgrounds and where the ideas come from and the future plans, so I'll be looking out. Um, I'll try and f keep tabs on dames making games for sure. Anyways, thank you.